Jika kalian menyimak video yang kami upload kemarin, ternyata hal itu adalah fakta dan benar adanya. Dan kali ini kita akan mengomentari bagaimana tentang keaslian dari kitab mereka. Apakah benar kita mereka itu benar-benar asli murni dari Tuhan atau murni ucapan Yesus? Nah, kali ini kita akan mendengarkan beberapa pendapat dari para pakar sejarawan Kristen yang sudah level Profesor Perjanjian Baru. Dan mereka saat ini sudah meninggalkan iman kekristenan. Kenapa bisa begitu? Ada apa sebenarnya? Mari kita simak video selengkapnya. I'm Bart Ehrman, and I'm very happy to announce a new course, Why I Am Not a Christian. How leaving the faith led to a life of more meaning and purpose. You can sign up for the course at bartehrman.com slash lifeafterfaith. This course will be unlike any other I've ever given in any context. It will indeed cover major issues involving the New Testament, early Christianity, and the formation of the Christian religion but it will also be deeply personal and autobiographical. Saya sangat-sangat menyesal masuk Islam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Sahabat official dimanapun berada Semoga kalian selalu sehat ya Dan semoga kita semua senantiasa istiqomah Dalam iman dan Islam hingga akhir hayat telah Dijauhkan dari segala bentuk serta upaya Pemurtadan pendagalan akidah Dan upaya-upaya penyesatan dari umat sebelah Senang sekali rasanya kami masih bisa diberikan waktu dan kesempatan untuk memberitakan kebenaran dengan mempelajari tentang kitab-kitab Allah mana yang masih muni dan mana kitab Allah yang sudah disesatkan oleh para penyurat atau pena palsu para penyurat dan diikuti oleh nenek moyang umat sebelah hingga hari ini. I became a scholar because of my Christian faith. Then my Christian faith changed because of my scholarship. My quest for truth led me to evangelical Christianity. And then, as I grew, matured, learned, and reflected, it led me away from the Christian faith altogether. In this course of lectures, I explain how it all happened and discuss what the results were for my scholarship, my understanding of Jesus, the New Testament, and early Christianity but also for me personally on the social, emotional, and personal levels. The course consists of four 40 to 45 minute talks to be followed by a long question and answer period. I'll be covering topics I've never lectured on or written about, and I'll be telling stories I've never publicly shared. My goal will not be to convert or deconvert anyone. It'll be to discuss the problems of the Christian faith as I myself came to see them through a serious and sustained engagement. I'll explain why, in the end, these problems led me to leave the faith, and how my move into agnosticism, atheism. Nah, sebagaimana yang sering kami sampaikan bahwasanya banyak di antara para profesor perjanjian baru yang pada akhirnya malah meninggalkan iman kekristenan atau meninggalkan agamanya setelah meneliti kitab Bible-nya. Tentunya hal ini bukan karena kebencian, tetapi karena keilmuan mereka. Di sini kami akan tunjukkan bagaimana perbedaan antara pendeta dengan para profesor perjanjian baru ini atau para sejarawan Kristen ini. Saya kuruskan badan saya sampai 35 kilo. Kenapa? Ada seseorang yang datang kepada saya dengan frontal, dengan vulgar. Dia katakan apa? Pendeta kok gendut? Dia bilang begitu kepada saya. Pendeta kok gendut? Gimana mau ngomong sama jemaat? Wong oh, rakus makan semua dimakan. Saya aku iya pada saat itu saya rakus. Ya saya aku saya makan banyak sehingga saya jadi gendut. Dia berkata, kalau kamu pendeta gendut, kalau kamu pendeta rakus, kamu mau kasih contoh apa sama jemaat? Kalau para pendeta ini mereka mempelajari Bible dan kemudian mengajarkan kepada jemaatnya dengan harapan atau mengharap imbalan dari persepuluhan sesuai keyakinannya. Tetapi para pen, para profesor ini justru mempelajari Bible dan kemudian dengan tujuan untuk mencari 
kebenaran dan kesalahan yang mutlak lalu menyampaikan kepada umat bukan untuk mengharap imbalan apapun karena hal ini merupakan sesuatu yang harus disampaikan kepada manusia sebagai periwayatan sejarah yang benar dengan cuma-cuma atau dengan cara gratis pasti bayar perpuluhan dia ya. puas banget dia seminggu sekali gak usah cuci-cuci ya kan gak usah bergerak-bergerak kita kan bayar 10% makanya kita kebaktian tenang aja Ya kan, paling berdiri nyanyi tempat itu eh, santai. Ya kan, tapi kok dua setengah, setengah mati. My view is that these decisions should be made carefully, not unreflectively. The unexamined life is not worth living, says Socrates in Plato's Apology. I came to embrace that view already as a committed evangelical. And it ended up leading me in directions I never expected. My hope is not that this course will convince others to end up where I did, but it is to encourage others to follow a similar path. Thoughtfully, honestly, thoughtfully, honestly, and earnestly pursuing the questions of what to believe and how to live in order to find a life of meaning and purpose. A typical day of lectures like this would normally cost around $90 or so. A typical day of lectures like this would normally cost around $90 or so. This one though is completely free to anyone who wants to come. Nah, apa sebenarnya yang melatar belakangi profesor perjanjian baru ini yang kemudian memilih menjadi ateis setelah mempelajari kitab Kristen? Dan dia sudah tidak percaya lagi terhadap Bible. Di sini mari kita akan simak poin penting yang kami kutipkan sebagai pembelajaran bagi kita semua ya. Dan menambah keyakinan kita terhadap kebenaran Islam. God gave you a brain to think with. Apply reason. That's why God made you a human being instead of a slug. Don't be afraid of using your intelligence to find out the truth. The truth may not be what you were taught, but if it's true, you should believe it, not run from it. As I studied more and more using my intelligence as an evangelical, but also praying about it, I became convinced that the New Testament Gospels were not written by eyewitnesses or by people who knew eyewitnesses. The first point to make is the rather obvious one that the Gospels don't claim to be written by eyewitnesses. They are all anonymous. The titles in your Gospels, the Gospel according to Matthew and so forth, were added by later editors. They were not put there by the original authors. Second point, none of the Gospels claims to be written by the person whose name it bears. They don't claim to be written by eyewitnesses and they don't claim to be written by people named Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Those are later traditions that were added to the Gospels. These traditions do not start appearing for about a hundred years. Some people think that there is an early church father named Papias who attests to the witness of Mark and Matthew, but in fact there are very solid reasons for thinking that Papias, who lived around the year 120 to 140, is not referring to our Mark or our Matthew. The first time anybody refers to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John by name is Irenaeus in the year 180, a hundred years after these books were written. My understanding of the Gospels as they've come down to us is that they were anonymous and we don't know their names and they're not built on eyewitness testimony. The Gospel writers were living 40 to 50 to 60 years after Jesus died. They wrote the Gospels in Greek. Jesus' language was Aramaic. These Gospel writers were living in a different country Decades later, where did they get their information from? They were not the followers of Jesus. They don't claim to be followers of Jesus, the disciples. They're written by later people decades later in a different language. Where did they get their information from? They heard stories about Jesus that had been in circulation year after year after year, decade after decade, down to the time that the gospel writers living in a different country, speaking a different language, heard the stories. What happens to oral stories when they are transmitted orally? They change. 
the gospel writers have discrepancies among themselves because the stories that were told and retold were changed over time and the gospel writers themselves sometimes change the stories that's why there are discrepancies that's why scholars might be able to tell you generally what Jesus was about they can list eight things that Jesus did but they can't tell you the details and agree why can't scholars agree because there are so many discrepancies that the Gospels are not reliable just take a very simple example Mark chapter 5 is an interesting story of Jesus healing the daughter of a man named Jairus Jairus comes up to Jesus and he says my daughter is ill please come and lay your hands on her so you can heal her and Jesus starts to go to, to to see the girl, but he's interrupted on the way. And before he can get to the house, some servants come from the house and they tell uh, tell Jairus, don't worry because she's dead already and there's no reason to bother the master anymore. Jesus says, that's not a problem. And he goes to the house, she's dead now, but he raises her from the dead. Beautiful story in Mark chapter five. Matthew also tells the story in Matthew chapter nine. But in Matthew chapter nine, when Jairus comes to Jesus, he says to him, my daughter has just died. Can you do something? Well, wait a second. Now, in Mark's gospel, the girl hadn't died yet. She was sick. But she died when Jesus was delayed. But in Matthew, she's dead already. Well, which is it? In Mark chapter 1, the gospel of Mark, uh, we read at the very beginning that uh, we read, As was written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face to prepare your way for you. This is in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before you. This is a very interesting passage because the passage that's quoted is not Isaiah. It says in Isaiah the prophet, then gives the quotation. The passage quoted is actually Exodus. So it's interesting that in uh, the later manuscripts of uh, Mark's gospel, the text is changed. Not this, so that it no longer says in Isaiah, as it's written in Isaiah the prophet. Jadi, sahabat ofisial, baik yang Kristen maupun yang Muslim, tidak perlu kami jelaskan lagi ya. Kalian sudah bisa mendengar dan menyaksikan sendiri apa yang dijelaskan oleh profesor ini dan apa yang terjadi pada kitab agama sebelah. Kita manusia diberikan oleh Tuhan atau difasilitasi oleh Tuhan berupa akal atau otak untuk difungsikan secara maksimal untuk mengenali mana yang benar dan mana yang salah dan tentunya apa yang salah itu tidak bisa dimanipulasi untuk bisa menjadi sebuah kebenaran apalagi untuk diimani secara membabi buta lalu bagaimana dengan riwayat pencatatan kisah Yesus di dalam Bible seberapa besar untuk diyakini sebagai suatu kebenaran In other words, they would accept the dominant view that Craig has laid out for us, that, they, uh, that we can know something about the historical Jesus. But in getting to that view, they claim that 78% of the sayings of Jesus were not actually said by him. I'm not championing the Jesus seminar because I disagree with a lot of things they do, fundamentally disagree, but I'm just trying to make a point. You can say there are historical nuggets here and there and recognize that these are not historically reliable portraits. Just a couple of other things. Craig wants to insist that our Gospels are better than the second century Gospels historically. He's absolutely right about that. The New Testament Gospels are not historically accurate and the second century Gospels are even worse. Craig wants to say that the discrepancies uh, do exist in the Gospels. He agrees with me on that, and I am so glad he agrees with me on that. But let me point out that if you have these discrepancies between two Gospels, they can't both be right historically. You might think that they're right theologically, you might think that they're great literature, but they can't both be right historically. question then, as Craig has paraphrased it, is do the Gospels provide us a historically reliable portrait of Jesus? And he answers yes. I want him to tell me which one does. He's already told us that the Gospel of John does not because it links theology and history. But so do Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're not objective biographical accounts of Jesus. They also have the same problem that John has. 
Which one of our Gospels is historically accurate? If one of them is not accurate, then how can we say that they give us an accurate portrayal of Jesus? In fact, the Gospels are full of discrepancies, they're full of contradictions, they're full of false historical information. They may be valuable to you as a Christian believer, but, as Craig pointed out, historians have to pick and choose. The reason they have to pick and choose is because there's so much historically false information in the Gospels. Thank you very much. Jadi itulah kebenarannya ya sahabat ofisial bahwasanya apa yang dipirmankan Allah di dalam Al-Quran itu memang benar dan nyata. Yahudi telah merombak Taurat sementara Kristen telah merombak Injil dengan pena palsu para penyurat mereka. Dengan tangan-tangan mereka sendiri. Betapa mudahnya Allah menunjukkan kesesatan-kesesatan agama mereka kitab mereka melalui orang-orang cerdas dari kalangan mereka sendiri mungkin pendeta dan jemaat Kristen tidak percaya dengan sumber yang baru ini baik kami akan tunjukkan sumber dari sejarawan yang lama yang sudah masuk Islam mari kita sini which we actually do it's interesting because you see this confusion here like i said we are not trying to step on nobody's toes but this information is out there and it should be known now what we have in the verbatim word of god the quran which is kept intact since it was revealed memorized by millions all over the world you have a verse in there that god almighty allah is saying that woe to those that write the book with their hands yes. and gain a mis miserly price woe to them for what their hands are right Yeah, we, we certainly do, and, and we can see this uh, specifically in terms of some places in the Bible where we know when something was added, you know, why it was added, we even know where it was added. Give us some examples now. Yeah. If I could reach over here to uh, King James Version of the Bible, yes. and I'm, I'm using this one because the King James Version is from a, a late Greek source manuscript, uh, not an early one. And this is what you'll find in the King James Version. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now that's what you find. And that's what this is that? This is uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Yeah. And that certainly sounds like the Trinity, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, but this is a late Greek manuscript. That they're translating from. Now, if we go to the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which goes back to much earlier manuscripts, and we look at the same exact verse, we find this. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. And that's it. Everything about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and being in heaven, and these three are one, that's a later edition. That does not exist in the oldest manuscripts. And in this particular case, we know when this was added. It was added around the year 380. It was added in Spain, in a manuscript in Spain. And from there, it went into the Latin Vulgate, Jerome's translation of the Bible into Latin. And then subsequently was picked up from Latin sources and some late Greek manuscripts, which is how it got into the King James Version. But the original, there's absolutely no mention of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the one from, I believe it's Mark, towards the end, where you have a bits, whole chunks that are oh, not... It's the last part of Mark. Most of the early manuscripts end with verse 8. This is chapter 16, verse 8. That's where it ends. But in later manuscripts, it goes on from, chapter, from verse 9 to uh, verse 20, talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Most of the early manuscripts end with verse 8. This is chapter 16, verse 8. That's where it ends. But in later manuscripts, it goes on from chapter from verse 9 to uh, verse 20, talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And this is a, a big later edition. Nah, bayang. Kalian sudah bisa menyimak dari komentar para profesor yang telah meneliti Bible secara objektif dari manuskrip aslinya secara langsung. 
Mereka katakan secara belak-belakan mereka jelaskan kepada kita semua tanpa ada yang perlu ditutup-tutupi atau disembunyikan. Namun para pendeta tidak pernah mau tahu kebenarannya. Misalnya seperti video dari pendeta yang kemarin yang sudah memfitnah Maria Magdalena sebagai seorang pelacur. Padahal Maria Magdalena itu justru adalah istri dari Yesus itu sendiri. Maria Magdalena ini adalah pelacur. Wonderful story, beautiful story. The entire chapter is a later edition. Doesn't exist in the earliest manuscripts that we have. Doesn't exist in the earliest manuscripts that we have. I mean, this is uh, something profound. I mean, it's amazing. Any sincere person, what should he do now? What does he do? He's confused. You've confused some people. Some people knew it from the from the get go. I mean, where do we go from here now? Well, a person needs to study, uh, and this is what I would advise any Christian to do: study your Bible. And study a good translation of the Bible, and the one I would recommend is the New Revised Standard Version because it does go back to some of the earliest manuscripts that we have. Um, and then get a good Bible commentary, one that's done by scholars, such as the Interpreter's One Volume Commentary on the Bible, published around 1974, I think it was, or 1971. Study these. Uh, there's no substitute for study. Become familiar with your own scripture, uh, and as many converts to Islam have discovered, by studying the Bible, this was actually one of the things that led them to Islam. Nah, bagaimana menurut kalian, sahabat official, tentang fakta bahwa kitab sebelah itu sudah banyak sekali dirombak, dirubah, bahkan ditambah-tambahkan ayatnya. Jadi bagaimana mungkin seorang Kristen yang cerdas bisa terus bertahan dengan kitab yang penuh dengan rekayasa tangan manusia? Saya sangat-sangat menyesal. Kenapa tidak dari dulu saya masuk Islam? Ternyata saya temui Islam itu adalah agama yang baik. Setelah saya masuk Islam, saya memiliki kedamaian. Dan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala memberikan saya ilmu tentang Al-Quran itu yang merupakan pedoman hidup saya di bumi dan di akhirat dan jika kalian menyukai tentang pembahasan dan ilmu pengetahuan kristologi seperti ini jangan lupa ya untuk kalian share ke teman-teman sahabat kalian di sana agar mereka juga turut mendapatkan dan bertambah wawasan serta pengetahuan tentang ilmu kristologi seperti ini agar semakin banyak orang yang semakin yakin kepada Al-Quran sebagai firman Allah jangan lupa di share ya sahabat official Allahumma inni as'aluka bi'anni ashadu annaka anta Allah la ilaha illa anta Antal ahadu samad Lam yalid wa lam yulad Wa lam yakullahu kufuan ahad